Buying a new orchestra library as a beginner can be a very daunting process because you don't really know what you should look out for. So when you see a deal coming at you, Symphony Series Collection on sale until the end of June, you're like, oh my God, should I get it? Should I not? Should I let me ask Alex because I have no freaking idea. Now, the issue is that I myself have never tried Symphony Series Essentials or the Symphony Series Collection, or many other libraries that people come at me with, asking me, hey, can you make a review about this library? So the fact is that I will never make a review about stuff that I never tried. I cannot give you an opinion about something that I don't know anything about. So what I want to do in this video is rather give you guys the process that I go through and the things you should look out for when buying a new library. Now, this is obviously my own take and my own opinion. Before the guy attacks me like, Alex, you fucking loser, you have an agenda and this is not right information. You shouldn't talk on YouTube about this. Uh, calm down. This is just my opinion. What I'm saying right now might not fit to everyone. This fits to me and it's what has been serving me so far. Now, also, this video is not going to be edited because my Adobe Premiere subscription is just right now and I don't have time to renew this afternoon. Anyway, so let's go into it. What are the things you should look out for in Rare Library? So uh, a few things you should look out for are first, the price of the library. Second, if the library runs on, on contact, if you have the full version of contact, or if it runs on contact player. Third, the articulations you get with the library. Fourth, the amount of gigabytes. And fifth, you want to check out the manual to see the function of the library that it has, what it allows you to do, if it has multiple mic positions and stuff like that. So how do you do that and why do those things matter? Well, my friend, I'm going to explain you that just right now. Uh, so I'm going to use Symphony Series Essentials as an example. Again, never tried this library, never touched it. So this is not a review of Symphony Series. It's my thought process or what I go through. The first thing I ask myself before buying anything in life is actually, do I need this? And for VST, DAW, uh, music software and stuff, that question has to be asked to yourself in function of the music that you want to make and the software you currently own. So for Symphony Series Essentials, who is this library for? Well, I suppose this is a library for the people who maybe, you know, you never had a professional orchestra library before. You don't have a library that gives you access to a wide range like strings, woodwinds, brass, percussion instruments of the orchestra sections in a professional format. If you are like that, you've been composing for free, with free libraries all the time and now you want to upgrade to something that is more comprehensive and professional, then this makes total sense. For me, it doesn't make sense at all because I have so many orchestral libraries right now that what I need is something more like Cinematic Studio Strings, which is a separate library made only for strings at the same budget of, I don't know, Symphony Series Essentials, for example. So while this will give me, you know, strings, brass, woodwinds, and percussion, I suppose the quality of the strings here will not be the same at all as, sim as um, Cinematic Studio Strings. But that is true for me only because I have so many different orchestral libraries already that cover what I what Symphony uh, Series Essentials would be. But if you don't have any, any orchestral libraries, then totally makes sense to buy a library like this one, which is comprehensive and has many different instruments in it and gives you access to the whole orchestra in a professional and realistic way. Uh, sort of like standpoint and format. However, what you want to check out as well is, as I said, the price. Here it says price 119. That's the first thing you see because we see the lowest prices. However, on top of that, it says 300. And these are pounds, so I suppose it's a bit different in dollars. Uh, maybe it's 300 dollars, I don't know. But anyway, why are there two prices? Well, one says cross grade. Cross grade, in this case, what does it mean? Let's check it out. So we go here on the sales page and we have the Symphony Essentials and the Symphony Series, which by the way, when you see Essentials and and then the, when you see Essentials around the name of the library, it means that that is a smaller version of a full library, which costs more. So in this case, there's Symphony Series, which is a full library, it costs double the Essential one. So that's to be considered. The essential is like a tri, not a tri pack, but it's a much smaller. It says like, this is 18 gigabytes for download. This is 165 gigabytes. So you see there the difference. But basically, if you go here, say cross grade, it tells you, okay, this is the price in cross grade. Only works for users of complete 2 to 12 or complete 11 to 12 select. So if you have complete 1 to 12, then you can guess the pri this price. If you don't have that, and you don't have complete select or whatever, then you need to buy the full version, which right now is not discounted. So while well, you see this price, that cool thing to ask yourself, or a good thing to ask yourself is like, do I know any other libraries at the same price that have the same thing? So you may want to go on Google and look for 
all comprehensive or all in one orchestral libraries contact for 300 pounds. And you're going to find maybe there's Albion One, you're going to find there's Jaeger for $500, Metropolis Arc One for 500 euros or stuff like that. You might find my video where I made a, actually a definitive guide, like where I talk about one hour about all the libraries I use. And you might find some advice there. There's also um, Burning Orchestra Inspire. And if you check out those, those, you find all those options. And what you want to do is obviously find the options that represent the criteria that you're going for all in one libraries in this case and then you analyze them this way what you want to do is to analyze their gigabyte size for example so and and, and that's not the first thing that comes to mind because when, when you see these websites on like this you know, like the website of a library you see the design you see the style and you read to like this library was recorded in budapest 60 piece string section you're like oh my god this sounds so professional already and this looks so professional already. And that's appealing and that's great. And I'm not calling out another instrument for that. I think this is actually a good thing to do, to design your product in a way that portrays the actual value that you put in the product. However, some developers, and I'm not saying native instruments, because again, I never tried this, but some developers sometimes pay more, they invest more into the like what the library looks like rather than what it sounds like. So I've been victim of buying stuff that looks amazing and has incredible, amazing text and incredible title just to be uh, served with a product that I end up never using because it's total crap. And I'm not going to name what library it is, but you know, that happens. So what, what you want to do is like to actually pay attention to what matters, which is the sound, the freedom you have, the programming and all those things. So the, I think that the most uh, indicative parameter for this sort of things is usually the amount for orchestral music libraries. It's usually the amount of gigabytes of stuff. Because more gigabytes means more samples. And samples, I mean recordings of those instruments. So if you see here, we click, there's the, each page for each ensemble. We click on the string ensemble, and you can go down, you check out uh, the, the stats says, so the simple essentials, which is what we're looking right now, the one for 100 pounds cross grade, has three gigabytes of samples, while the full version has 30, 34, and this is just the strings. So this means maybe in this one we have way less samples, way less round robins, way less functions. So it's, uh, in, indeed it says like you get uh, 30 gigabytes, 38 articulations, offers a compact library with a streamlined selection of essential features. Though able to offer high realistic results, this version is ideal for pop and electronic producers thanks to its speed, simplicity, and reduced storage requirements. Pop and electronic music producers. Are you that or are you a composer? If you're a composer, you might need this full version. Here you can see also the articulation library in, and it says the differences, like his that this has customizable auto divisi, which is a nice feature to have. This doesn't have divisi. This has a legato emulation, so the legato is, is like software. And with legato, I mean, uh, the legato is like when you sing to, like, you have two notes, like, da, da, the legato will be the, da, like that, that, da, that sort of passage, like, that blends in between the two notes, that legato, that's kind of legato. And legato emulation is done with software. True legato is re actual recorded. That sort of passage is recorded for every single interval in, of legato. It's going to sound way more realistic. It's awesome to use it in melodic lines and stuff like that. So it's good to have. Uh, here it also says one microphone mix, no mixer page. Here it says four microphone mixes and with mix, mix, mixer page, which means you can set the closed mic position or far mic position and stuff like that. And when you're a beginner, you don't really care about that. You just care about the sound. But... Uh, Having a library that has mic positions available will actually give you the freedom to actually change a bit of the sound, like the, the, the character of the sound. If you use closer mics, your strings, for example, are going to sound way more aggressive, way more defined. It's going to cut through the mix way more easily without you having to actually do many things to them. And uh, less muddy as well. Well, if you want to make the sound a bit more atmospheric and take less space in the mix, but still color your track using the far mics might give you that thing, that that sound and that's a very great way to actually change the character of your strings a library that doesn't doesn't have those things has a definite sound and that's the only mic position you have so you don't have as much freedom and if you want to change that you cannot but again if you're a pop producer or edm that you don't really care but if you're a composer and you have to write with a full orchestra then that maybe matters as a beginner it does not obviously but as you grow it will and if you have a library that gives you that freedom that's better right uh so that's to be considered uh also Another thing you might want to do is to check out the articulations. So here we click on articulations, it says 38 articulations. That sounds like a lot. If you check it out, the page says, okay, you have actually seven articulations for the basses and cellos and eight for violas, violins, uh, etc. And which they are, they're sustained, which is like, da da. Sordino is uh, sustained, which is like way less loud. Tremolo is like, da 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 da
pizzicato is like when you pluck the, the string and it creates a very round sound or something like that. I made a video about articulations where I explain how they work, how you can use them co to compose better. And these are very useful. All the libraries, like very old libraries, don't really have them. They are like Susano Spiccato, but they don't really have trios and staccatos and, and stuff like that. And when you hear a real orchestra play, these are all used usually. And that's what makes, like when you hear a, 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 a track, you're going to think it sounds realistic inherently if you hear, if your ear hears that the violins does don't only do sustain, but you also change articulation all the time. That feels real. So having a library that allows you to change articulations is top notch. So anyway, yeah, uh, as I said before, you also want to check if the library works with a contact player. So a cool thing to do if you're on a library page, you control F, you type contact player for use with free contact player version five and higher. Awesome. That means that if you don't have contact, you can use the free contact player, which is the free version of contact. And this library will work with this. So you can actually buy this uh, and then use contact player. We saw before that you cannot buy the cross grig version without uh, owning complete. So Obviously, if you want to use this with Contact Player, you need to buy the full version. Uh, but anyway, some libraries don't have uh, Contact Player compatibility, so you always want to look for that. Uh, right now, if you want to buy Contact, I think, uh, yeah, it's uh, 300 pounds, I suppose it's 299 dollars when you convert this to like on the American website, which is not the actual conversion, but I think that's the price, I'm not sure. There's also Complete, which uh, is Contact plus many different libraries, many different gigabytes of libraries and stuff like that. However, I found that Complete libraries are not the best ever. It's a good bundle, uh, variable and use useful sometimes. But anyway, so you check the articulations and uh, one thing you want to be sure is that when you have articulations is that you have key switches. Key switches are a way to uh, program your articulations in your tracks by simply pressing one key. Like you load one patch, like one violin patch, and you can press one key, and that goes from sustain to staccato and stuff like that. That allows you to compose in one one window using different articulations and linking everything to the same MIDI control commands and stuff like that. Very useful for composing realistic stuff. So if you want to check out if this has keys, which is what you want to do is to go here and check the manual. Usually the manual is available in every single sample library website because it gives you more information about everything. It tells you exactly what they are, what, what the library is, how you can use it, what's the strengths of the library. The best developers, the more honest developers, they will also tell you the bad sides of the library as well as the good sides, like performance samples does that and I love them for it. But anyway, let's check if it has key switches. So I type key switches, control F key switches, and uh, if a central string sample is configured to select articulation by key switches, the corresponding, okay, awesome, it does. So we have key switches and uh, basically in contact, they are, you see them, they are the red keys. I'm not sure where they are right now. Uh, key switches, but yeah. No, I cannot see them. But somewhere in contact, when you open the patch, you're going to see there are some notes that are red. And those are the key switches. When you press them, you're going to alter uh, stuff in your library. But anyway, okay, so we saw that this one has, you know, the articulations, but it only has three gigabytes. The fact that it has such a slim amount of gigabytes informs me on the, on the, the thing that first, again, we don't have a legato, we don't have the mic positions, we don't have uh, the auto divisi, but also expect this to have way less round robins. Now, round robins are... Um, different versions of the same note recorded on a sp same instrument. So, for example, say you have a string, spiccato, ostinato that plays the same note, like 16th note, but the same note for like five times or 10 times. If you do that on a, on a library that has very few round robins, all those 16th notes, all the 10, 16th notes are going to sound the same and it's going to give you a machine gun effect unless you do a crazy humanization. But if you have a library that has loads of round robins, which means like different version of the same note played on with a different sample, then if you write six, like 10, 16th notes or something like that, uh, very fast and very like same note, they're going to sound different. It's going to sound more more realistic. So usually, this is, might not be true for every library, but I found that a higher degree of gigabytes gives me something that sounds more realistic, gives me more freedom and, and all those things. So three for a string library is a bit, it's a bit small. But if you never had any orchestra library before, that's, I suppose, a good, because you're pretty good, you know. Uh, but yeah, like, I'm, I'm probably forgetting. Oh yeah, the most important thing, obviously, of read the stuff. So it says auto divisi. You have no idea what divisi is. You can read about that here. Two polyphonic legato. You can read about that there. You can also Google it to see what divisi is, what polyphonic legato is, and stuff like that. Google is your friend, guys, uh, always. But who is more your friend than your friends? Uh, strange segue in the sense that I want to say. One thing you want to do is obviously ask your friends, hey, what do you think about this library? If they have it, not only ask if they have it, 
what do you think about this library? Is in its, it's why, tell me the good things and the bad things. And also, one thing you want to do absolutely is to listen to the library demos and in function of the tracks you want to write. Okay. Say, for example, I want to write aggressive, super aggressive trailer music with lots of electronic sounds, super loud percussion and trailer hits. What I would need for that is some string section that sounds mind freaking blowing. And by the way, another thing you want to make sure whenever you buy a library is to understand how it's split. So this one, is it, does it have, does it give me like an ensemble, like low string ensemble and high string ensemble? Or do I get like cellos, basses and stuff like that? You can see that in the manual. And we saw that before in the articulation space, by the way. It says basses, cellos, violas, violins, one, violins, two. So we're going to have patches and uh, with disc switches and they're going to be split. It's not like low string, high strings, but it's like the full range. That's good because when you compose for the full range this way, it's way more natural. Because say, for example, the basses are only, like this is a 60 string piece. We see, we saw that before, 60 string um, uh, ensemble. And obviously, this might be, I don't know, this might be, I don't know, I don't know 8, 8, uh, 14, 20, 20, something like that, you know? So when you have something like that, whenever you write one note on, a, I don't know, patch that has 12 violins, you're actually, each, the note sounds like 12 violins playing that note. If you write, if you write the, a triad on a 12 violins patch, what you're going to have is actually the sound of 36 violins. And that's my, that might sound unbalanced. So if you like that, that, I'm saying that because if you have a low strings and high strings libraries, uh, low string and high string ensemble library, uh, and the low string has 40 strings and the high string has 60 strings, whatever, if you, if you write for like five different uh, patches like that, two low strings and three high strings, and you write five voices, you're going to have like the three high strings, which are going to be like uh, 40, 40, 40, it's going to have, it's going to be 120 strings and the, the, the low strings with 30, 30, it's going to be 60. So you're going to have a, the sound of 180 strings and it's going to sound weird and huge and not realistic. Well, if you have something like this, where you have eight basses, 10 cellos, 12 violas, 24 violas, I don't know, uh, each MIDI note in this ensemble is going to be way more, you know, balanced because you're only writing for one section precisely. And that sounds boring. So like, what the hell are you talking about, Alex? But actually it makes a huge difference in terms of realism. Now... That's why you should look at the instruments that you get. And this is true for the strings as well as the, all the other things. For example, you, you, again, you want to write loud, epic, with the trailer music, something like that, then you totally don't need natural percussion for that. So that informs you to say natural percussion. Okay, that's probably not what I need. Then you need to check out what type of percussion do you have. And you go on the manual and it tells you, uh, you get, you know, this and this and this and that instrument somewhere. And then if you don't know what they sound like, you can go on YouTube and look for, you know, what, what they sound like. Or another cool thing is to actually listen to the demos. So to go back to the demos, listen to, like the demo of the library tells you basically in sound what usually like demo composers for libraries are very freaking great. So what you hear when you hear demos are the best results you can get with the specific library. Uh, might not be easy to get to that, that level, but you know you can actually get there because you hear that. So here it says, uh, Symphony Series String Ensemble Demo Tracks. String Ensemble is not the String Ensemble Symphony Essentials. This is Symphony Series. So this, these demos are for the Ensemble version, like for the String, string Symphony Series um, version, which is cost twice uh, the Essentials. So that's the first thing you need to care, care about. Second thing is think of the genre you have in mind. I have in mind big, aggressive, ignorant, loud trailer music. Let's listen and see if this gets there. Now the question is, does this sound good? Of course it does. This is a really amazing composition by Andrew Ker Kerestes. I think that's the way to say the name. I hope the video doesn't get flagged because I played the song. But anyway, this is obviously a good composition, but it does not sound aggressive to that level. I don't feel like super aggressive strings. This sounds like a film score. The dynamics are amazing, but it's not what I'm looking for. Let's see for the other, other demo. Amazing dynamics. Sounds really great. Still not aggressive like what I personally need if I need to write trailer music. Because again, uh, you need to make like, this sounds, this sounds like tight, precise, dynamic, alive, and stuff like that. But it will work better for a film score or game score. Mm -hmm. 
definitely does not have that bite that I want in my trailer music. So now that I appear that, the library is great and everything, but I appear this is not for me. I might look for a library that actually has that. And one that comes to mind is like Metropolis Arc 1. I think there's also Trader Strings, there's Trader Brass, that there's so many. If you don't, if you feel like this library is not the one for you, you shouldn't fret and feel like, oh, I lost, this is, I should buy it anyway and try it. Like you can also obviously buy it anyway and try to like make it sound more aggressive by using something like OTT and stuff like that. But it makes more sense to buy products that were designed at their core to be what you actually are looking for. And I assure you, there's so much choice out there that you're gonna find something. Maybe not for the same price, but you're gonna find something. Uh, if you're going for something very precise, if you're going for something more general because you have nothing that is, you know, I think it's a good way to go. But then understand this might not be the best aggressive library, right? This is good for dynamics. It's good for like film scoring, game scoring, but aggressive stuff, probably not so much. So, you know, also percussion, you might want to listen to the percussion demo, see if you have some, like if you're writing up trailer music, if you have some hybrid percussion, something like that. If you're writing something organic, I think this is perfect. But if you're writing trailer, I don't know. But anyway, uh, one thing you can do also is work, look at the walkthrough videos and you can go on YouTube and look for like tracks made with this library, writing like Symphony Series, Essentials, Library, Track, blah, 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 and see what you find. And uh, yeah, but basically th those, are, those are the things that I'm, I feel like I'm forgetting something right now. Uh, but I talked so much in this video already and I think this is already pretty good. Um, but uh, yeah, so th those, those are the things you should look out for when buying a library. And again, like guys, all needs to be in function of what the genre of music you want to make. Say for example, you want to write music like Marco Giacchino who made the Incredible score, uh, the Incredibles one and two. Uh, that score is like full of life because it's like big band, sounds like funky and jazzy and full of energy. Like the brass is so expressive, it's crazy. And here it says symphony essentials. Symphonic orchestral music is completely different from big band. Big band is like the Incredibles, like super jazz expressive. Symphonic is like solemn orchestral, big orchestral music and stuff like film, cinematic and stuff and everything. So if I needed some big band brass, I wouldn't go for this. I would go for, for example, Glory Days by Orchestral Tools, which is as expensive as probably the, the almost as expensive as a full version of this like full uh, symphony series, but this library guys like for example for 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 uh, big band horns this is freaking incredible from what I heard and you can still see like run through the analysis the gigabytes see the features see the it has legato what instruments you get what patches you get etc the manual etc cetera, etc. Cetera. But you can, like, when you hear the demos of this one, you're like, okay, this is totally big band and this is going to unlock that for me, you know? It's like when you, when you buy a library, uh, buying, like the, the difference between buying symphony series and big band uh, horns, glory days, is almost like the difference between buying an electric guitar and acoustic guitar or an electric guitar and a bass, you know? They are both sort of like guitar instruments, but you you should use them for two separate things. You cannot do, normally you cannot do, or you know, you won't get a good result by playing acoustic guitar in like rock format. You know, if you want to write metal with acoustic guitar, you can, but you're not going to write like massive guitar chucks like, dun, 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 with like acoustic. It's going to sound weird uh, unless you're, you know, you're a frog leap studio. But so that, that's what you need to think about, right? Like, when you have to buy a library, what sound do I want? What composer do I like? What style do I like? Let's listen to the demos. Do, do those sound close to the style I'm going for, to the loudness I'm going for, to the dynamics, to the, is the instrumentation the same in terms of like the instruments it gives me? Uh, and do I have a lot of articulations? Do I have the right mic, a lot of mic positions? Uh, et cetera, et cetera, yada, yada, yada. And especially does this fill a hole in my current equipment or do I currently have libraries that actually sound very similar? So maybe I don't really need this. Those are the questions you need to ask yourself. And those are a lot of questions. I understand, but we're talking about spending hundreds of dollars. So, you know, it's an important choice and the choice of a library, if you do the right choices, it, they can really unlock new areas of music for you and lead you to compose like never before 
and get great results. And Metro PSR one has been that for me, for example. But that's just me. Again, this is not an agenda. I'm not trying to sell anything. Despite what people believe on YouTube, it seems like if you make a video like this, people believe that you're trying to like be evil or something. But, you know, again, one regular I recommend a lot is first, you know, there's, there's a, when I made a video about the, why you shouldn't use free, certain free libraries, I listed in the description and in the video many different freebies that are free and amazing that you can use and start to compose that sound great. Uh, so you can check the list there on my video there. And uh, another thing I recommend is uh, called Composer Cloud from East West, which is this uh, collection of all the East West libraries for $20 a month, you get all their libraries in gold format. So you don't have access to micro, but it's like all the, you get Hollywood strings and stuff like that, which sound amazing. Again, Hollywood strings, I don't use them because they, they are more useful for like the dynamic golden age Hollywood sound of the film of the nineties and stuff like that, which is not the style I'm going for. But if you not, don't have an orchestra library, a professional orchestra library, and you want, you want to start diving in that field by using a, a, some tools that have all the standards, uh, programming and like all the, that reach the standards of the market right now, Composer Cloud is amazing. It costs nothing. Amazing gateway drug into this world at a very low cost. And you can write a track with Composer Cloud, sell it on Audio Jungle, get money by sale, sell, with the sales you make of the track, and then going for a library like... Metropolis Arquan and stuff like that, you know, nothing stops you. Nothing stops you either from downloading Spitfire Labs free soft piano, which is an amazing soft piano, which is completely free. Make tracks with it, sell them, license them, and then with the money, you buy a full library that sounds amazing. Nothing stops you. So for all the people who say, man, you're only talking about libraries that are expensive. I don't have the money. This is, I'm never going to make it. Those are shitty excuses. You're never going to make it because of your mindset. But the people who have the right mindset see all the strategies that are out there for free. They follow them. They get results and they get better and they get better gear and they get better libraries and they get better results and they keep on getting better and they keep on studying and improving and getting great equipment and getting great results. And you see where it gets to, where they get to. Like a friend of mine just you know, became one of Junkie Excel's assistants. Like, he's, he's, he's just another composer, like, well, he's really, really great, for example. He's really freaking great. But he's another composer like us who made the same path. He had to start somewhere and he got to the freaking Hollywood levels through many years of practice, writing music, investing in his libraries, investing in his skills and stuff like that. And it's not like he's superhuman. So if he did it, any one of us can do that. You know, and all the things you hear me do on my YouTube channel also, if I did them, you can do them too. So that is the short answer to what do I think about Symphony series and all the libraries that you guys ask me about. If I haven't tried them, I cannot give you opinions, but now you know what goes through my mind when I buy a library. Obviously, it's not a 30 minutes long process. It's much shorter for me, but I had to explain you the whys and the hows of how I do this. And... That's it for this video. If you have some corrections, some advice for people, leave it in the comments. But for now, I'm going to say goodbye to you guys because it's almost 30 minutes and I need to publish this video. So I hope you learned something of value. Subscribe to this channel for tutorials, good music and shit like that. And I'm going to see you next time with a new tutorial. Bye.